Welcome to Grow Virtually, an online horticultural educational program presented by the Master Gardener Volunteers of Cobb County. Under the guidance of the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Service, we grow gardeners. Welcome everyone. Our program for tonight is called Native Plants in the Urban and Suburban Landscape and our speaker is Katie Ross. Hello everybody. Uh, I'm, my name is Katie Ross. I'm the owner of Nightsong Native Plant Nursery in Canton, Georgia. So why native plants? Native plants have co-evolved with native insect species on this con continent for thousands, if not millions of years. And through this long process of co-evolution, herbivorous insects, which would be your caterpillars, grasshoppers, beetles, they're all able to recognize and feed on native plants. 90% of herbivorous insects are specialists, which means that they require a specific genus uh, of plant to feed on. Uh, that makes 10% of other herbivor herbivorous insects generalists, which means they're not as specific. Um, the poster child for a species or genus specific specialist is gonna be the monarch butterfly. Uh, most people are familiar that with the monarchs needing milkweed. Here's a picture of a monarch caterpillar and a monarch butterfly nectaring on a Asclepius incarnata. So natives, uh, why natives? Because insects rely on native plants and we rely on insects for many things, uh, but most commonly widely known would be pollination. Uh, native plants are beautiful and they serve a purpose beyond just aesthetics. And native spaces need not and cannot only exist in protected places and parks. We need these places to exist in our ever increasing and expanding suburban and urban landscapes in order to protect the future of biodiversity. So what is biodiversity? Uh, it's a term people are probably hearing a lot about and um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just biological diversity. So the variety and variability of life on earth or it within a particular system. So biodiversity could be, you could look at a different system being uh, your yard or maybe your county or your state, but it could also be something as small as the biodiversity of microbes in an inch of soil. Um, and the system of uh, biodiversity has evolved and interacted for millions of years it's made up of different genes, species, communities, and entire ecosystems. So the energy flow through an ecosystem with native plants. I love this cute little picture. It, um, it's pretty basic and straightforward. I actually stole it off of an elementary school <laughs> website. Uh, but plants have the unique ability to convert the sunlight into energy. The native insects that feed on those plants are then transferring that energy up the food chain. So the sunlight, the sun is the uh, source of all energy uh, on our planet. And that energy is converted by plants when they photosynthesize into food. And then the caterpillar will consume the plant, the frog will consume the caterpillar, snake, owl on up the food chain. Well, when you take that plant, say that that is not a violet being eaten by a caterpillar. Let's say that that's suddenly something here in the United States, here in Georgia, let's make that flower now a barberry. So the caterpillar's gonna look at that barberry and say, I don't even know what that is. I don't recognize that. So the caterpillar will never consume the plant and then on up your food chain that won't exist any longer. So native plants are for the birds. Songbirds need protein from caterpillars and insects, not from seeds and berries in order to fledge their young. 96% of birds rear their young exclusively on insects. So we always think, oh, well, I'll just put out a bird feeder and that'll take care of the birds. And that's great for feeding um, the birds when they are able to eat grains, but uh, baby birds need the protein from insects. Lepidopto Lepidoptera, which are moths, skippers, and butterflies that have evolved on this continent need the plants that they evolved with in order to host their caterpillars. So this is a list taken from uh, Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home, uh, the top 10 trees and shrubs that will support the Lepidoptera, which are the moths, skippers, and butterflies. So when I say support Lepidoptera, that means that these 
uh, moths, skippers, and butterflies are able to host on. So they will lay their eggs. The caterpillars will then be able to feed on the foliage of the plant. The uh, top number one at the, at the very top plant is going to be oaks, most specifically a white oak, Quercus alba, uh, with supporting 534, but I believe that number's gone up. Um, then we've got willows, cherries, uh, birch, poplars. One of the more interesting ones we kind of take for granted or forget about are blueberries, the vicinniums, which will support over 288 species. We always think about blueberries being good for birds because they will eat the fruit, but they will also eat any of the caterpillars that are hosting on the blueberry plant. If you plant it, they will come. So there is a black-throated blue warbler on an American beauty berry. And beauty berries are uh, a great plant for supp supporting birds. They will support over, I believe, 35 different species of songbirds. Uh, another really cool thing about beauty berries, um, not only are they a good pollinator plant, but the active chemical in uh, the foliage is calicarpinoid. Um, is uh, being tested by the University of Mississippi as a, uh, a, a mosquito and tick deterrent. So you can crush up the leaves and rub them on your arms and uh, it does help to, to prevent flea, uh, fleas, fleas and ticks. <laughs> uh, mosquitoes and ticks probably helps with fleas too. Um, there's, uh, if you plant the uh, purple cone flowers or other flowers that will have a cone, then the birds will sit up there and they will feed on the seeds, but they will also like to feed on the tiny little insects that are living inside the cone head, the, the, the little spiders and whatever else is in there. And then there's a tiger swallowtail tail on the hairy leaf cup plant. Native gardens grow wildlife. So if you want to see more monarch butterflies, you're going to need to plant milkweed. So here's a picture of poke milkweed, Asclepius exultata. Um, it is a shade to part shade milkweed. Um, gets kind of tall. It's a great plant for monarchs. They love it. It's got a big, a big wide leaf. But also, Monarchs will, any, any Asclepius, but they like butterfly milkweed, which is Asclepius tuberosa, which is one of the more common milkweeds most people know of, butterfly milkweed. Uh, you find it growing on the sides of roads and pastures, places like that. Likes full sun, can take dry soil. And then there's white milkweed, uh, Asclepius perennis, also known as aquatic milkweed. Can, glow, can grow in very, very wet conditions, but can also grow in typical garden conditions. I grow that one in a little bit of shade and it blooms just about all summer long. Um, monarchs love that one too. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful, that's one of my favorite ones to grow. It's really easy to grow. <clears throat> so if you wanna see fritillary or fritillary butterflies, you will need to grow plants in the Passiflora genus. So. Passiflora lutea is the yellow passion flower. It's the one on the right. That's got a little tiny flower. Uh, it's a beautiful little shade plant. And we've also got Passiflora incarnata, which is the may pop or the passion flower. That's probably, um, many people are familiar with that one. If you're not, then you're gonna think it's an alien, but it's not, it's actually a flower. When I was a kid, I remember finding these growing on fence lines and I would just be absolutely complexed and amazed by how these, these could actually be living plants because they are just so beautiful. And if you wanna see a spice bush caterpillar, which I call the most adorable caterpillar on the planet. I know everybody has their own opinions, but that's mine. I think it's, uh, I think he, he's trying, he or she's trying to look like a little lizard or a little snake with those eye markings. They're trying to mimic something else to prevent birds from eating them. And if you want to see a spice bush caterpillar or spice bush swallowtail butterfly, which is what that caterpillar will become, then you'll need to plant spice bush. Spice bush is a great plant for shady conditions. Um, females get the red fruit in the summertime and uh, it's a great, great shrub. <clears throat> so wildlife can no longer exist elsewhere. 
because our elsewhere, elsewheres are now strip malls, parking lots, or neighborhoods. We have to start providing habitat in our own yards. I remember when I was a kid, <clears throat> probably one of my first ecological awakenings, I remember thinking, well, so there aren't, so I grew up in Gwinnett County. I grew up uh, in the suburbs of Atlanta. And I remember thinking, so there aren't bears here. So if the bears aren't here, then the bears must be elsewhere. And if the bears are elsewhere, they're probably living in the mountains where there aren't other people. So that sounds like a cool place. I want to go there. Um, but elsewhere was always somewhere else. You know, we would, we would hop in our car on the weekends and we would drive up to the mountains and we would go and see all the beautiful trees and, and mountains and things. But it was, it was never somewhere, it was never in our neighborhood, which is, which is kind of crazy because my neighborhood had, you know, uh, woods and all sorts of beautiful trees, but we always thought of nature existing elsewhere, not existing in our own yards. Gardening and landscaping to support wildlife is now a necessity that must occur in these developed areas and neighborhoods because we are forever expanding into those beautiful mountain areas. Replacing non-native trees and plants in the landscape with native species must happen if we are to avoid localized extinctions of insects and birds. Habitat loss has occurred due to growth and development, but also the introduction of non-native invasive plant and insect species. So what are major roadblocks for biodiversity and ecosystem health? Habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation, non-native insect, non-native plant and insect species, non-native diseases and pathogens. But also what about the lack of knowledge among everyday people? <clears throat> so there's a new term called plant blindness where uh, people basically aren't able to recognize plants. They, they just, they, they overlook them or they just never stop to really think about them. Here's a picture of my daughter. She's, uh, she's, in, she's, she's probably a typical nine, 10 year old who is obsessed with anything critter. Um, she loves frogs. She'll probably grow. I hope she grows up to be uh, somebody who studies uh, wildlife, but she's just absolutely obsessed with them. Not interested at all in plants. She's just like, whatever. So she's kind of a typical plant blindness <laughs> example. Uh, but she just absolutely is <clears throat> just enamored. She is constantly on the lookout for, um, for, for anything alive. I hope she'll get over that. I hope when she gets older, she'll really realize the connection. So habitat loss and fragmentation. Where will all these wild things go when we have no wild places left? This is a picture flying over the Atlanta airport. Familiar site where we're all familiar with. Uh, that is a perfect example of habitat degradation and fragmentation. You still have some wooded areas, but a lot of those wooded areas don't connect. So a lot of things cannot live there. So habitat loss from invasive plant species through accidental introduction or once planted for ornamental livestock and land use purposes, invasive plants have been taking over and destroying urban, suburban, and rural areas. Privet kudzu, bamboo, English ivy, mimosa, Bradford pears, and Japanese honeysuckle are all well-known invaders. We all know about these, at least most of us do. Um, you know, kudzu, the vine that ate the south. But did you also know that Mahonia, Miscanthus, Nandina, butterfly bush, barberries, birding bush, crepe myrtle, Rosa Sharon, Eliagnus, Japanese spirea, Inca major and minor, daylilies, lantana, and liriope, just to name a few, are all listed as invasive plants with a severe or emerging threat of spreading into and damaging native ecosystems, uh, according to invasive.org. Um, so yeah, these are all plants that we're all fairly familiar with growing in our yards. Um, and here's a picture, a friend of mine went over to the UK and was just shocked and appalled to see the uh, butterfly bush has become incredibly invasive over there, growing out of walls and out of uh, buildings, growing in cracks in buildings. And 
Uh, here's a picture of it just growing uh, invasively on the side of the road. And, you know, I ask you, you know, I know a lot of people, they get real sensitive when I bring up butterfly bushes. They're like, oh, don't you start with my butterfly bush. And I get that. I, I understand. We all have the things we love. Um, I love gardenias and I love fragrant tea olives. Um, but the problem with butterfly bushes is they are an emerging invasive plant species. The uh, seeds can be eaten and they can be, they can travel through birds uh, and travel far. I actually found a butterfly bush had seeded into the ditch across from my nursery. Uh, so it is beginning to become an invasive plant. I know up in North Carolina, there's been a, a lot of it. Um, but I, you know, I ask you, is this a, is this a, is that a pretty picture? Is that a plant that you're going to go, Ooh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you know, butterfly bushes when they bloom are nice. Uh, but when they're done blooming, they look pretty bad my opinion. Don't get upset with me. So most stunningly, all of those plants that I listed can all still be found at your local garden center. So let's talk about the once sterile, non-invasive, non non-native pear tree. So the Bradford pear. Uh, so Pyrus caleriana, um, Brad, Bradford being the cultivar, was uh, first introduced I believe back in the 60s, but it was when I was uh, growing up, it became fairly popular in the 80s and the 90s. Um, when I worked in horticulture starting in the 90s, we probably sold hand over fist Bradford pears constantly because they were sold as a fast growing, uh, spring blooming uh, shade tree. So you know, they were easy to grow for growers. They were easy to sell. They were something that was just like, you know, churn them out as quickly as you can. Um, then people started noticing that they were splitting and they were like, hmm, you know, maybe that Bradford pear is not quite what we were thinking. Maybe we need to try and introduce some new cultivars with different genetics, different background genetics, different coming from different genotypes that uh, that maybe it won't split, maybe it'll grow a little slower and it won't split so bad. So we had some new cultivars introduced with different genetics and suddenly that once sterile non-invasive non Bradford pear was able to start cross-pollinating and becoming fertile and was no longer sterile. So we have, um, I remember when um, my father probably gosh, 15 years ago, was uh, decided to plant some Bradford pears in our yard, in his yard. And I remember thinking, dad, why on earth did you plant these plants? I did not give you permission, <laughs> uh, but he planted them. And uh, a year, probably a year or two later, I came back and I looked at them and I was like, what on earth? These have fruit on them. Bradford pears are not supposed to fruit. And they were tiny little fruit. And I remember thinking, that's very, very strange. And then I kind of just walked away. All right, whatever. Well, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the plant becoming an invasive species. Birds love to eat the pears and they spread them. So we think, well, that can't be all bad. If the birds are eating the fruit and spreading it, then, you know, at least the birds are getting fed. The problem is they are very fast growing and they're able to create thickets which crowd out all other native plants. And if you'll think back to where we talked about uh, native Lepidoptera feeding on native plants, the Lepidoptera, the moths, butterflies, and skippers will not recognize this plant that's from Asia. They did not co-evolve with it. So it is not a recognized food source. So therefore baby birds that need the protein from the Lepidoptera, they're not, they, they will not get it from that. So. That is the problem with Bradford pears beyond the, beyond the point that they also really smell bad. So diseases and pests that were introduced by the nursery industry. I'm gonna go over this real fast. I don't wanna get anybody too mad with me, but chestnut blight in 1904 was introduced by Japanese nursery stock. The hemlock woolly adelgid in the 1920s was brought over on a hemlock from Asia that somebody thought the native hemlocks weren't special enough, so they brought over the, the uh, an Asian one. Uh, citrus greening disease, which is a common 
in California, and I believe it's also spread into uh, Florida. And then sudden oak death. That is another one that uh, is being watched pretty closely. It was first discovered in California in 1995. Uh, the nursery industry almost spread it from the West Coast here to the East Coast on a shipment of rhododendrons and camellias. Um, a lot of the rhododendrons that you might find in nurseries are grown in the Pacific Northwest because they love those conditions and they're able to grow them more quickly. And then they ship them over here and the sun note death uh, pathogen can also live on rhododendrons and camellias and it will kill oak trees. So traditional landscape methods are another issue uh, with native landscaping. Um, so the traditional methods of landscape management are not very sustainable. They require huge inputs of gasoline, man hours, pesticides, and fertilizers. And they have large out air outputs of air pollution from exhaust, water pollution through runoff, noise pollution, et cetera. Management of native landscapes can be less impactful, less expensive, and use fewer resources. And I always tell people, talk to your landscapers. They often don't know that what they're doing is, is impactful and they're just trying to do what they think they should do and they want to make you happy. So if you go to them and say, hey, you know, don't blow all my leaves into bags, uh, you know, leave some in my in my perennial beds. Um, I def, you know, I get it. Yeah. Clean the leaves off your grass because it will kill your grass. It will be a slippery hazard on your sidewalk. Um, but leaves are very important for 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 soil regeneration. Native landscapes can look tidy and neat. They kind of get a bad rap. Um, a lot of times people go in thinking, I want one of everything and I just want to see it take over my whole yard. And I get that because I've done that before too. Um, but really the key for native landscaping, especially in your front yard, um, is maintaining and defining your bed lines, using mass planting and drifts, which will give the space purpose. So mass planning would be, a, you know, five, seven, nine, uh, depending on the space, up to as many as you want. Um, but using more, fewer different species, larger numbers of each of each species. So you know, five of these, nine of those, versus one, 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 one. Using planters and raised beds help to define a space. In meadow gardens, you can maintain a mode strip that defines the area, which is called a cue to care. Maintaining a line of sight to the house and other key features you'd like to highlight in your landscape. So don't plant something in your front yard that's going to block your front door unless you want to block your front door. And turf is, turf is fine. Um, you know, a lot of people have gone anti-turf. I think turf has its necessary uses. It can be used for my dogs to run around and play in. I have turf for my kids to run around and play in. I say turf very loosely because it's a lot of weeds. Um, and But turf is a great place for, as far as design, it's a place for your eye to rest. So when you're looking at a landscape, if turf is used properly, it's kind of a relaxing green strip or area versus you know constant color everywhere. Um, and several using using different cultivars that have been developed to stay small and more tidy. So cultivars have kind of become a hot topic in the native industry. Um, people are either for it or totally against it. Um, I so let's talk about first of all what is a cultivar. So a cultivar is basically a plant that has been cultivated for specific uh genes so here's a picture of uh wild uh uh echinacea purpurea the middle picture that's the top picture on the left the middle picture is echinacea purpurea cultivar magnus and then the third picture i'm not quite sure which one it is uh but it's an echinacea of some sort um but it's a double flowering I don't know. I don't know what it is. I should have probably looked up, looked it up. But anyway, um, that is that is a hybridized and kind of crazy. Less uh, insects aren't going to be able to find anything to use on that plant. So uh, 
So cultivars can be helpful. So the Magnus cultivar was kind of, was bred to be a little less tall. It's supposed to stay a little tighter, darker pink, um, bloom longer. And I've grown them side by side and I do like some of the cultivars a little bit better. Um, as long as it is not, uh, as long as the, gen the, the selection isn't for something that's going to prevent uh, prevent pollinators or wildlife to be using it, then, um, you know, I, I think it's, it, it can be fine. Uh, Phlox paniculata gina has actually had um, tests done and it will actually attract more pollinators than just the straight species. Um, so, you know, cultivars, um, or some people call them nativars, which is supposed to be a native cultivar. They can be useful, especially for, uh, for HOAs. Uh, I go, I use a lot of um, different cultivars for people who come to me and they say, hey, I've got this front yard. I really want to have some, some color in it. I would like to still keep it native. I'd like to have some uh, attract more pollinators and, and make it pretty. Uh, but my HOA is crazy. So I'll say, okay, great. Well, we've got Coreopsis auriculata nana, which is a, which is a, a dwarf Coreopsis. Um, Jacob Klein bee bomb, which was a wild uh, found, was found on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, it's a Monarda didyma. It stays tighter. It uh, is more um, powdery mildew resistant. Um, I love that one. Uh, but you know, if you're looking to do some type of a restoration project, say you're, you know, you you've got a, um, you know, your backyard, or you want to do some kind of a, a big restoration. You know, obviously don't use cultivars, use straight species. So translating native landscape concepts to the public and to landscapers. Through certification of landscapes, you can really kind of help to convey the message. Um, you'll get an attractive sign, um, which will uh, help the public be educated as well as connect them with your landscape. Um, Here's different landscape signs. This one is mine in the middle. It says in this yard, we believe native gardens grow wildlife. Native plants are essential to life. Pesticide free is the only way to be. Organics are good for people and pets. Healthy soil is alive and amazing and everything in nature is connected. So, um, so we have those signs for our customers that you know they wanna be able to explain to their neighbors what maybe they're trying to do in their yards um, so that, that kind of helps with that. It gives people a good talking point. Uh, you know, it's nice to be able to talk with your neighbors about something other than, hey, how's the weather? So working towards beauty and harmony in your landscape. Um, make peace with the fact that nothing is perfect and neither should your landscape be. So as we have all come to find through 2020 and 2021 that the world is not perfect, um, and we shouldn't put these impossible standards on our landscapes. I know I get stressed out when I go out in my yard and I see all the weeds and I see, you know, I'm like, no, I want us to be look much nicer. Like, but it's, it's not, it's not always attainable. And so we need to not stress ourselves over it quite as much as we do. If you or your HOA do insist on a perfect front yard, make your backyard a more natural area for you and nature to rest and relax. Choose plants that are not listed as invasive species and beware of new introductions from Asia and Europe. Never buy plants that have been treated with systemic pesticides. They will also kill the insects you're trying to attract. So neonicotinoids or neonics, um, uh, you're not hearing so much about them as much in the, in the news anymore, but um, to the right, there's a tag. I'm not sure if y'all can see it, but uh, one of the large box stores um, had uh, a little campaign going that said, don't worry, your plants have been treated with neonicotinoids. So they're not going to get white fly or anything. They're going to get white fly or aphids. Um, but as it turns out, those plants are also, the, the pesticide is carried in the pollen. So when a pollinator goes to a plant that's been treated with neonicotinoid, it can be exposed to, uh, to that chemical um, and will often die. Um, I pulled this tag out of a blueberry plant that was treated with the neonicotinoid 
Um, and studies have also shown that when plants have been growing in the ground, you remove the plant that the, the, there's re res residue from the chemical still in the ground. So buy your plants from growers who can guarantee you that they do not use synthetic pesticides, or if they do, they are well-versed in methods that can cause limited, that will cause limited ecological damage. So not all growers, you know, I tend, we, my nursery is, um, we try to not use anything synthetic. Um, sometimes some fertilizer, I'll use, have to use something early spring just because the microbes in the soil aren't awake. So they're not doing much for organic fertilizers and containers. Um, but uh, we don't use any pesticides. Um, but you know, some, some nurseries, small growers, they might choose to. And as long as they know what they're doing and they're using them responsibly, um, then, you know, that's, that's their business. Uh, leave your leaves, don't deadhead, quit pruning everything and enjoy the little critters that you're going to attract. So that's little Cope's gray tree frog there in the corner. And if you love it, plant it. So I, whenever I would give this presentation back in the early days, um, I would always do it for these garden clubs and I would get these these looks of just complete shock and dismay and sometimes anger. Uh, <laughs> like, how can you tell me I can't plant a hydrangea? And that wasn't really what I was trying to say. I think I used to be more of a purist than I am now. Um, you know, I, I get it. I love gardenias too. And I love blue hydrangeas. I don't, I don't necessarily love roses, but I, you know, I love a lot of these plants too. I grew up here in Georgia. My great grandmother, my grandmother were all gardeners. I go to my grandmother's house and there's camellias that are, you know, over a hundred years old. And our plants are important to us as gardeners, as, as, as plant lovers, we, they mean a lot. They, they mean more than just a pretty, just a pretty thing to look at. A lot of them are connections. So we have a gardenia and maybe you remember your grandmother's gardenias and something like that. So these are all important things. And just because they're not native, it wouldn't be, uh, you know, planted. If you love it, plant it. We need more people planting plants that, and getting into gardening and loving and protecting plants. But also if you're gonna plant those, also plant some natives. There are, there are so many beautiful native plants. Uh, mountain mint on the left is a picture of uh, Pycnanthemum muticum, which is the clustered mountain mint. Um, if y'all have ever been to my nursery, you've probably seen it, especially in the summertime. It is absolutely covered in pollinators. I mean, that plant for four months will just be attracting every solitary wasp and bee and, and little tiny skipper butterflies, flower flies, all sorts of amazing stuff. You will not get bored if you have a mountain mint in your yard. You just go out there and sit and watch it in the summertime and, and there it is endless entertainment at least maybe just, you know, for us plant nerds. Uh, Joe pie weed, that's another great one that attracts tons and tons of, of butterflies in the summertime when it blooms. Spigelia Indian pinks, that's just a beautiful, beautiful plant. So here at Night Song Native Plant Nursery, we are working towards a gold standard in plant production. So what we are trying to do is um, use locally sourced seed which is open pollinated, uh, which will capture local e ecotypes and genetic diversity. So uh, with native plants, you have, um, you have, or just open pollinated plants, you have uh, genetic diversity coming from, when a pollinator goes from plant to plant to plant to plant, they're bringing in the genetics from other plants and then to uh, you know, fertilize and then to get the seed. So as we all know, with like dog breeds or whatever, it's best to have good genetics and to have a wide gene pool. So uh, really what we're trying to do is to source those uh, type of plants as much as we can. And we're doing it all without pesticides, as I said earlier. Um, you know, I, I do use, uh, I will use a, a neem, neem oil. Uh, that is an excellent pesticide. It is uh, from the tea tree, derived from a tea tree. It's an organic native or native organic natural product. Uh, however, it will kill. So 
we will take, if we need to treat something, say oleander aphids on our milkweed, we will take the plant, we will put it on a cart, we'll take it into our carport where we do all of our potting up, away from anything, and we will treat it, let it dry, and then watch the oleander aphids die, which is, which is, uh, oleander aphids are awful. Uh, they were brought over in the oleander plant <laughs> uh, from Asia. Uh, but they also recognize milkweed as a food source. So oleander aphids are those yellow bugs that are all over your milkweed. Um, uh, but then we rinse off the neem oil. We rinse the plant and we rinse the dead bugs off and then we move it back out. So we, we try to prevent any, uh, any, anything getting to uh, any of the, the, the neem oil. So pretty is as pretty does. Native gardens support wildlife. Pretty is as pretty does is what my great-grandmother used to say to my grandmother, my grandmother said to my mother, and my mother said to me. <laughs> so pretty people act like they're pretty. And same thing with plants, you know, really. Uh, or they don't act like they're pretty. They act pretty. They're kind. They're good. Uh, same thing with plants. Um, a, a, to me, a pretty plant is a plant that's actually doing something, that is contributing to wildlife, that is a, that is a pollinator plant. So, um, that's a, a drawing I had my my uh, father-in-law draw draw for me. And if you're going to tinker with the earth, at least keep all the pieces. Out of Leopold, um, wonderful naturalist. And I wanted to show you all a book, but I'm not sure if I can do it because uh, I'm not sure if you can see my picture. But there's a really great book called A Naturalist Book of Wildflowers. It's a new book that's out by Laura C. Martin. Um, Y'all should look into it. It is really awesome. I know next week or next month you've got Tony Harris doing his presentation. Um, and I should probably get him in touch with her so he could get a copy. But she did so much research on this book. And it is it is just so interesting. It's not just about she did all the, the drawings, too. But it's not just about um, uh you know, the, the plants, it's about the how the plants were used and the folklore of it. And it's the kind of book you can just sit down and, and pick up and start reading. And it's really, really interesting. So um, I believe that's all. If y'all have any questions that aren't addressed tonight, maybe you're a little timid, feel free to email me at nightsong, N-I-G-H-T-S-O-N-G, natives with an S at gmail.com. And um I believe that's it. Thank you for listening. We hope that you will find our information informative and helpful. Thanks for watching, and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel.